The Red Sea encompasses something in the range of 4,000 dugongs, but they are difficult to find, difficult to photograph. It's not like dolphins that jump in front of the boat and just <laughs> plays with you. They are very shy. They are mysterious, and with all these legends and stories told from the past, these kind of magical animals. Usually you don't develop legends for something that you know very well. <laughs> because legend is imagination, and imagination fills the gaps of knowledge. That makes me like attracted to this mysterious animal. But I worked in the Dugun and the conservation in Dugun's long time before my first sighting of the Dugun. It's a very, very like emotional feeling when I saw them for the first time indeed. I'm trying to identify which areas that the Dugun's use for feeding and then this area will be proposed for high priority for the conservation. If you want to enjoy the beauty of the, the sea, you need to pretend that you are a marine creature. When, when the other creatures accept you as a friend, this is when you see everything natural. So the more that you blend within, within this group, the more that you can see things as normal as they are. It's like like uh, quite a music, especially when there is like some waves and some currents indeed. I mean, just this kind of like a music blending with the feelings. You should think and behave like a dugong to understand dugongs so that you can find them. Dugongs are not easy to find. You need first to understand what dugongs looks for. Look into the sea grass in the eyes of dugongs. There are a lot of decisions that the dugongs make while grazing. They look for the best of the best of sea grass. Now they are very selective if they have the chance to be selective. How to maximize my energy intake by grazing the best of the sea grass? Or should I graze it one time and leave to another meadow so that I don't overgraze this meadow and keep it for the future? If you just look from the sea grass or from distance, you won't understand how important it is. You need to get close to the leaves, we call them blades, and look around. The blade of sea grass tells you stories. Who came here? Who lived here? Is it good for dragons? Is it good for turtles? Good for fish? Is it good for sea urchins? Are they sheltering here? It's like a whole picture. It's like it's a painting, you know? It's very important that uh, we translate what we collect from data into tangible conservation measures. Otherwise, uh, I mean, still the animal will continue to be threatened. The more that you open the doors for your imagination, indeed, the more you start to understand things better. So it's not, yeah, we collect data, we are scientists, we collect data, but at the same time, we need to think in a broader scale in order for us to understand this complexity in the interactions between different components of the environment. When I looked at the seagrass, it's a very simple plant that it grows in the, in the seabed. When I looked at the dugong, it's a very simple animal just grazing the seagrass. But when I look, the reaction, interactions between these two, I mean, how dugongs graze the seagrass and how the seagrass will respond. People think it's very simple, but it's much more than that, indeed. It's our job, it's our responsibilities as scientists to highlight not just the ecology of dugong, to highlight how important is animal to the local community, to the local culture, to the oceans, to the world indeed, and then later we translate this into tangible conservation. There is increasing pressure put on the dugongs and on their habitat, and this is alarming. But I am hopeful, because when people get in love with the dugongs, 
they'll definitely understand the importance of protecting and conserving their feeding grounds and habitats. I am hopeful indeed for conservation. <laughs>